Oh, you mean here. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wildemar Beach Congregational Church. I'm Mary Claire Hansen. I'm here with Logan and Lucas today. Hope everybody's having a great day. We're having some New England weather the last couple of days. A little bit of sun, a little bit of clouds, a little bit of cool, a little bit of warm. If you don't like it, wait a minute. A lot of wind, too, yesterday, yes. We had a successful tag sale again yesterday. Thank you to everyone who assisted. I have the totals from Paula. The total tag sale uh, netted $384, $165 for table fees, and $219 in sales. So, and most of the people who participated are coming back for our second tag sale on September 23rd. So um, everybody's looking forward to it. Everybody enjoys the event. Um, so uh, thank you to everyone who helped yesterday. We were very grateful. Um, the rest of the announcements for today. Um, Karen Murray um, has a uh, schedule for the summer where we're looking for hymns, for uh, that your favorite hymns, so that she can schedule them to be sung during the summertime. I guess these were in the bulletin last week, Karen. And so there's some more um, out in the back table and out here and right over here. So if you didn't uh, fill out your slip and you have a favorite hymn you'd like to hear, please fill that out today and put it in the collection plate. Um, our prayer list for this week, please pay attention for members and friends of the congregation. Um, keep all those people in your prayers. There is one correction to the bulletin. It does say Sunday, June 11th, Mother's Day worship service. <laughs> it's actually Sunday, Sunday, June 18th is Father's Day service. We are also going to be dedicating the men's lounge that day. Um, so uh, hopefully everybody will attend. Paula and I have signed up for uh, to host uh, the fellowship hour. And speaking of that, the fellowship list for the next three months is hanging up. We do need some volunteers to host or hostess um, fellowship time. So if you are able to do so, please sign up out in the hallway there. The church council meeting is a week from tomorrow. So uh, please, um, people who have reports that need, they need to prepare, please prepare them and email them to the council at your convenience. Pastor Ken's still working on a new member class. If you're interested, please see Pastor Ken. Birthdays for this week. <laughs> Logan Hansen has a birthday. How old are you going to be? Five. <laughs> Caroline had a birthday the other day. Today is Avery and Reagan Granger's 16th birthday. Yes, they are 16. They've already informed me they're getting their learner's permits. So watch out. And Jason Hurst, who is uh, Lee's son, his birthday is on the same day as Logan's this week. Yeah. No way. So anniversaries, uh, Clinton, Helen, the plant had an anniversary this week, and our son and daughter-in-law, Kevin and Melissa, had an anniversary this week. Yes! <laughs> are, there, are there any other announcements? Anthony. Uh, Dean Smith is asking if we can remove the tables and chairs from the fellowship hall after fellowship time. Okay. So anyone not doing anything before or after choir, uh, we want to move all the chairs and tables into the children's room so that he can buff the floor out. Okay, wonderful. So anybody who can help after service and after fellowship, that would be great. Any other announcements this morning? If not, let's please prepare our hearts for worship. Okay, here. Box. Ring the bell. <laughs>
If everyone would please stand and join in the call to worship. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belongs glory and might. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We will now sing chorus only for King of Kings. remain standing for our prayer of invocation. O oh God, lift your people from doubt to faith. Lift us out of our cynicism, our skepticism, our unwillingness to believe that the good may be true into a courageous faith concerning you and your purposes. Illumine us until not only shall our mountain peaks shine, with a new confidence, but with the valleys shall be your splendor. And we have faith again in ourselves and in those around us and in you. Amen. You may be seated. Let us all join together now in our prayer of confession in unison. Lord, be merciful to us. We confess that we have refused to carry the burden of the cross. We have denied you rather than face the loss of friends or criticism of the crowd. We have sought comfort and safety rather than risking our lives to do your will. Grant us your pardon, gracious Lord, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who now hears the silent prayers of our hearts for which we seek forgiveness and pardon. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we gather in your name to worship you today, we thank you for your faithfulness experience again this past week, and we look forward and hope to continued joy and blessedness in our relationship with you in the coming days of this week. We ask as we gather for complete cleansing of every and all of our sins, and for a refilling of your spirit, we very much need that, that we might in this service worship you in ways that are pleasing and honoring. Encouraging, uplifting to these who have gathered as well as others who are listening in. And now we ask these blessings in your son's name and for the kingdom we pray. Amen.
And now as we do the first Sunday of the month, we stand and we read the statement of faith. We're using one in the back of the hymnal today, and we'll do it as a responsive reading. I'll let Mary Claire side go first. Back of the hymnal. We believe in God, the eternal spirit, father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the worlds into being, creates man in his own image, and sets before him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges men and nations by his righteous will, declared through the prophets and the apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death, reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church, accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his servants in service of men, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, and resist the powers of evil to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins, fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, eternal life in his kingdom, which has no end. Together, blessings and honor, glory and power, be unto, unto him. him. Amen. 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 Thank you. Please be seated. So I have uh, one addition to the bulletin. I don't normally make a big deal out of uh, anniversaries unless it's every fifth year on a fifth year. But next Sunday is pastor's anniversary because it's my 11, finished 11 years. Now, I'm only mentioning that because pastor who was the pastor when I came to town was Hart Inlow. He was here for 11 years. We support the mission, the Lion of Judah Academy in, in Africa that he was instrumental in starting. Following him, there were two pastors, Doug Lyon for six years and Arthur White for four. I know Doreen will remember these people. Then John Thursby, who was my immediate predecessor, was here 11 years. So I matched John and I matched Hart with God's grace and with your help. So we want to recognize those faithful pastors. Um, all but I think Arthur is still living. Arthur is with the Lord. He was a, a wonderful gentleman. He was uh, semi-retired, I would say. Would you say Doreen when he was here? Yes. Um, and gave good counsel and direction. And uh, he and... Uh, John used to invite me to come and speak when I was at the, at the village, so I go back a little bit in that way. And Debbie always wants to mention that she's here longer than me because she started playing piano for the church uh, back in uh, August. Uh, it'll be 12 years in August. Okay. We continue our worship now through our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
thee but thine own. Bear the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. I trust the Lord. Children may go to Sunday school now. Whoop. <laughs> Can't go. <laughs> this morning's New Testament reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. Please listen to the reading of God's word. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This ends the reading of God's word. So that was a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, and talking about Matthew. Matthew is still with us. He's looking to leave now on Monday, tomorrow. See, he had such a good send-off last week, he decided he'd go for a second blessing. <laughs> second blessing, so he's looking to go tomorrow. So we have a traveling bunch. we got to welcome back Jim Fulton. Where you get to? There you go. go. <laughs> Traveled all over the south, something like 6,000 miles. And how many miles did you travel on foot? 355, and he took some wonderful pictures, so we're going to get a travelogue sometime uh, this fall, okay? But welcome back, Jim, and um, Joanne was there waiting for you, no doubt. She's been to church the last couple Sundays, yeah. So uh, the Mosses, they, they managed to make a trip to Hawaii and came back, and uh, Rebecca and Adrian. They went to Montreal, and then they went to Madrid. We have a traveling bunch of people. Did I miss anybody? Where were you? Okay, so you're going camping. All right, okay. So, you know, all these, all these people traveling, I didn't get one single postcard. I did get I did get a lot of pictures from Jim. I did get a lot of pictures from Jim. But I guess postcards are just really passe. Yeah, it's hard to find them, yeah. Some kid said, what is a postcard? And the mother said, it's a text message with a picture. <laughs> text message with a picture. That's a postcard, yep. Okay, so today we're talking about the first church, following last Sunday's sermon on Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. So at the conclusion of Apostle Peter's address there at Pentecost Sunday in Jerusalem, in the temple courts, the disciples had moved there from the upper room. Peter addressed the crowd. And in his closing remarks, he said this, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, 
whom you crucified, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, meaning the Messiah or the anointed one. We're reading this in Acts chapter 2. When the people heard this, it says they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. And they said, brothers, addressing the apostles, what shall we do? What shall we do? Very good question. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, just as they had. Now this promise, he says, is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. And that's a reference to people spiritually far off, but also uh, maybe of the Gentiles as well, because there in the temple courts there was a court of the Gentiles. And for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now, indeed, the coming of the Spirit, which had taken place there in Jerusalem, also occurred as the gospel spread to Samaria, to the Samaritans, and also to the household of Cornelius down in Caesarea, who was a God-fearing uh, Gentile and his family and folks that came to faith. Now, he goes on to say that with many other words, so in addition to the Pentecost sermon given there in Acts chapter 2, it says, with many other words, he warned them. What did he warn them about? He warned them about sin and God's judgment. He warned them about sin and God's judgment. And he pleaded with them. Now, we also know that the Apostle Paul, in the second letter to the Corinthians, said, since we know the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Since we know the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. So this was not just a message about love. It is true that God so loved the world, he sent his only son, and God does love us, and he loves us even in our sin. But in addition to that message, which is one side of the coin, there's also the other side about sin and judgment. So, he went on to say this. So then, you yourselves, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation, as he was warning them. Now, it occurred to me that if Peter, addressing the folks there 2,000 years ago, warned them about sin and judgment, encouraged them to save themselves from the corrupt generation that they were part of, what would Peter say today about the times in which we live? What would he say about today? We have not only political corruption that we hear so much about, but we also have moral corruption. And especially uh, in a month in which we live. Pride is not a good thing, according to the Bible. Because that's talking about ourselves rather than God. And certainly... It's uh, a lifestyle that is counter to what the creation account and the creator had in mind with his creation. So we live in a morally corrupt time, a spiritually corrupt time, a politically corrupt time. And I think the message today, if you're going to be faithful to the scriptures, is to tell people to save yourself from the corrupt era and generation now, those who accepted his message, it says, were baptized. They were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the number, the number having been just 120 that had been gathering there after Jesus' ascension and before the coming of the Spirit on Pentecost. They were gathered, they were, they were there together, 120, along with, of course, the 12 apostles total of 120. 3,000 were added to the church in one day. Can 
you imagine that? 3,000. This was a very powerful sermon that Peter gave. Peter, who had denied the Lord, uh, been reinstituted back to ministry uh, there in Galilee, and with the coming of the Spirit, gave this very powerful address that led 3,000 people to come to faith. As he said to them, you need to repent and be baptized. And they responded to that message, accepted his message, and believed in Christ as their Savior. So next we are given in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to verse 47. Next we are given a description of what the early Christians did, their activities. Uh, the first church in Jerusalem. You know, there's always uh, in certain towns and cities, certainly here in Milford, our first church was the first everything. Pastor Peter Pruden, his little band flock, came here, bought the land from the Indians, and uh, established uh, Milford, 1639. I think uh, we're like the sixth oldest city in the state, certainly one of the older cities uh, in the history of our country. Uh, Plymouth goes back to Massachusetts, 1620. The settlers in uh, Virginia were in the early 1600s, 1607. So 1639, Milford is one of the older uh, communities in, in our country. And the first church was the first everything. <coughs> so, and by the way, we are, we are the first congregational church on Willamere Walnut Beach. Yeah, we're the first church because it, there was some discussion whether it was Walnut Beach, Willamer Beach, and back and forth of Walnut Beach Chapel, and the name has changed a little bit. But, um, you know, there's certain, there's certain uh, you know, to be the first to something, right? So the first church, we're the first down here, okay? Uh, we're actually older than uh, St. Gabe's, I believe. 1910, see, 1895. So we're the first church down here in the West Shore. So we got the first church uptown. Uh, so what was life like in the first church in Jerusalem? The first church. What was life? Well, we're given a description here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to verse 47. It says, they, the believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and a prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. He gave to everyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. There's a little description of what life was like in the first church, the first church of Jerusalem. So let's just review this and note again what I just read. It says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Notice it doesn't say they devoted themselves to Jesus' teaching. Because Jesus, he didn't write any books. He gave a lot of teaching, gave a lot of sermons, but he didn't write anything down. But the apostles, who spent three years with them, they heard all this. And so the apostles' teaching was Jesus' teaching. And they were sharing the things that Jesus taught to the early believers. Also, it says, they devoted themselves, and the word devoted is not in front of the fellowship, but I think you can assume that. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Note, it doesn't say to fellowship. It says, look, important article there, the fellowship. The fellowship, meaning the body of believers, their commonality. The breaking of bread, the breaking of bread. 
And we'll see a little bit later in the same passage that uh, we talked about they were eating in the, together in, in the houses. And so uh, this is talking about them having meals together. And uh, no doubt, as we see later in the book of Corinthians, uh, a lot of times there would also be a love feast and there would be communion along with that. But the breaking of bread. When Jewish people uh, would gather, uh, somebody would break the bread and pray. Remember the story of the, the two disciples who were going to Emmaus, whom the Lord joined them and went with them, and then they didn't recognize it was the Lord until in the evening, as they got to where they were going, they were about to eat, and when he broke the bread and prayed over it, that's when they realized, they recognized that it was the Lord. The breaking of bread, the beginning of a meal, the taking of a loaf of bread and breaking it and pausing to pray. Do you pray over your food before you eat? Yeah, that's a very, very good thing to do, and good opportunity also to witness. You're out with a group, say, uh, can I can I offer a blessing? And people say, okay. Wait till everybody gets like a mouthful of food and then say, <laughs> Can I offer? <laughs> the breaking of bread, eating together. And then it says, and the, uh, the prayer, the prayer. Prayer is simply talking to God. Let's elaborate a little bit more on these four things that were the early activities of the first church. The apostles' teaching. Now, for us, that would be the New Testament because it's now been written down, but you got Matthew, he wrote a gospel, okay? You got John, he wrote a gospel. Mark, who got information from Peter. Luke, who did a number of research in different ones. He was the only Gentile. He wrote a gospel. Uh, you have uh, the Apostle Paul, who was uh, added to the apostles, and wrote uh, many of the epistles, Romans, etc. cetera. Uh, John would write, of course, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, uh, James and Jude, uh, brothers of the Lord, they wrote. So the New Testament, our New Testament, is the apostles' teaching. But they didn't have a New Testament. They didn't have, they didn't have a Bible like we have. Uh, there were scrolls of the Old Testament books, etc., but most people didn't have them. They would go to synagogue. Somebody would read. Uh, those who could read uh, would read the scroll that belonged to the synagogue. But the early Christians... They, they wanted to hear, what did Jesus teach you? What did he say? You, you had spent three years with him, had heard him, uh, and Jesus sometimes repeated himself because he was talking to different groups or uh, saying things that uh, needed to be said. Because sometimes it you know, went over their disciples' head. They didn't particularly get it the first time, so he had to say it more than once. So uh, the apostles' teaching was, for us, the New Testament. You notice it in our service? Beginning of the service, somebody brings in the Bible, places it up here uh, on the uh, altar. But uh, our sermons, our sermons that come from the Bible. I don't preach from Time Magazine or Newsweek. Uh, recently, somebody uh, on LinkedIn said, what, what book do you preach from? I said, I preach from the Bible. You know? uh, but that must have been kind of like a revolutionary thought for somebody. You know? I'm not one of these creative persons that can come up and make up stuff, and uh, uh, I don't have that kind of mind. Uh, I would never be able to uh, spend 40-some years in the ministry uh, preaching 40, 50 times a year uh, if I wasn't teaching from something, just the Bible and God's Word. And you you don't want to come hear what I got to say. You want to hear what, what, the, what the Lord said and how that then applies to our lives. And so... Our textbook is the Bible, and the Bible is the teachings of the apostles and, of course, along with the Hebrew scriptures, the prophets, etc. So the early Christians, they listened to the apostles who had been the disciples, the followers of Christ who are now called and sent, and uh, they, were, they were anxious to hear the things that Jesus taught. And uh, later these things then would be written down, and they became our, our New Testament. It says, and to the fellowship. Now, fellowship is a, is a wonderful thing. Uh, and we enjoy fellowship. Yesterday we were working together. Uh, we enjoy fellowship before and after the services here. 
Uh, that's, that's fellowship. But this talks about the fellowship. And that means the, the combined uh, bond that exists in, in a spiritual uh, setting in, in the body of Christ, the church. The fellowship. Uh, and, uh, you know, some churches uh, actually don't even call themselves a church. They just call themselves a fellowship, so-and-so, uh, to emphasize that important part of our relationship with God, yes, and also with one another. The fellowship. The fellowship. The breaking of bread. Um, eating together. The early, there's something about having a meal with people and sitting down and eating a meal. And I think that's one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, this little church does best. Uh, our coffee and is turned into lunch every Sunday. And you notice there's always enough food there. It's kind of like the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. Happens every Sunday. There's always food. I don't know what's back there today, but there's food back there. And uh, uh, I enjoy just sitting there. Some, some people say, why don't you sit over here by yourself? Why don't you sit over here by yourself? I said, well, you notice I sit near the food. <laughs> I sit near the food. And everybody comes over to get the food. And, and uh, if I sit at a table, I basically just talking to those people at that table, but if I sit there, people will come over and talk to me. If somebody has something to say to me or some questions or some comment, they, something they want to share with me. So I sit there, yes, but I'm sitting close to the food, and uh, you're coming back for seconds or for first, but uh, the, the uh, meal together on Sunday, and uh, as we invite people to come to the church, we invite them to stay uh, for the fellowship, the fellowship that's around the breaking of the bread, uh, I think that's a very important uh, of uh, why the little church has come to life and, and has grown uh, because of the, of the fellowship and uh, there's something about eating together. And uh, we have some wonderful cooks here. We haven't published a cookbook, but uh, we could very easily do that. Uh, the, the baking, the cookies here, you know, just phenomenal. So the breaking of bread is eating together and sharing that time. Uh, as, a, as a spiritual family. And then it says, and the prayer. Uh, a service of worship should include time for prayer. And uh, in prayer, yes, uh, we have prayers where we address God, we're speaking to God, but prayer should also be a two-way conversation. We ought to be listening to God as well as when we're praying. I don't know if you, while you're praying, you know, uh, Deborah and her mother, it's interesting, when they're on the phone, they both talk at the same time. Now, they say they can talk and listen at the same time, but, you know, that's a little bit different from my family. Somebody would talk, somebody would listen. Somebody would listen, somebody would talk. They talk and talk, listen at the same time. It, it doubles up the amount of time on the phone, I guess, whatever. <laughs> but uh, two-way conversation. Prayer should be a two-way conversation. We all know friends that uh, we don't hear from for a while. They call us, and uh, as soon as they, they don't even bother to ask, is this convenient time to talk? You know, phone calls sort of interruptions, uh, but uh, you know, sometimes they just get right into why they're calling us, and they, they, they dump a whole bunch of stuff on us, and it's, oh, but I, I, excuse me, I got to go, and they hang up. You have friends, friends like that? They, they call, they do all the talking. They don't bother even ask you, how you doing? Is this convenient? How's your day going? What's going on in your life? Uh, what can I pray about for you? They just dump everything on you, and then they hang up. Well, that's how most people approach God, I think, in prayer. You know, when you need God for something, you know, give God, you know, here I am, you know, me again, and this, that. But do we, do we listen to God? Prayer should involve not only speaking to God, but listening to God. And even as we share uh, our thoughts, uh, we can kind of, you know, hear some things coming back as well. Like, you're really asking me for that? Didn't you ask me that before? Uh, I got something better in mind. Uh, maybe you should be praying about this or that. The Lord, the Spirit can kind of indicate to us in prayer what maybe we ought to be praying about. And then if we're praying those prayers, those prayers certainly are going to be heard and answered. So these are... The four activities of the early church, the apostles' teaching, that's the word, the fellowship, the 
eating together, and of prayer. Now it says, everyone, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Notice that. Wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. It doesn't say all the believers, but these sign gifts were evident there with the apostles that was authenticating their ministry, even as Jesus and his miraculous powers authenticated who he was, that he was indeed the Son of God. They were now operating according to the gifts that God had given them and the power that was on their lives. And these things authenticated that indeed the message that they were sharing was legit, that it really was of the message of God. And miraculous signs and wonders were done, again, giving honor and glory to God, the Father, not to the individuals doing the healing and miracles, but to the one who was behind all that. Everyone was filled with awe by these miraculous signs that were being done by the apostles. We read on in verse 44, it says, And all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone as he had need. Selling their possessions. Did they have a gigantic tag sale? Is that was the first tag sale? Is that where this came from? They were selling their possessions and then giving this back to seeing that the needs, if somebody had a, if somebody had a need, that their need was met. Not their wants, but their needs, their basic needs. There was such a bond of fellowship that people shared. And so some people say, here was early communism. Early communism. Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, it was uh, definitely a, a very Christian thing of people sharing, yes, selling possessions and helping those who had a need. You know, here the Galileans were fishermen, but they were in Jerusalem. Their livelihood was, was back in Galilee. So how were they living in Jerusalem if, if somebody wasn't taking care of them, giving them a place to stay, seeing that they had meals? Now, there were some maybe in an area that... Uh, had property and had things, and uh, they were able to help out and support the uh, ministry of the apostles and uh, other believers who, who had needs. And such was the bond that existed there. Such was the fellowship that they had a sense of responsibility. That if somebody had a need, I, I, I don't particularly need this item or that. I can sell this, and I can, I can then donate that. So... Uh, the needs are met, and it was being done. Amazing thing of true commitment to the fellowship. This is an amazing true commitment to the fellowship. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and the temple was a large complex. Around it was these uh, colonnades, uh, porches, uh, various courts, and so that was where they would go and gather. And there was places that they could indeed gather and where teaching could be taking place. It says they broke bread in homes. Those that uh, would live there invited folks over. People came by, they ate together. And it says, with glad and sincere hearts, they were praising God and enjoying uh, the fellowship together, but they also had favor with all the people. All the people had a positive view of these early Christians. In the temple courts, in their homes, worshiping, praising God, yes, enjoying that relationship they had with God and with one another, but they had, uh, as people viewed them, they had a very positive impact on their community and on their society as people who were God-fearers and uh, seeing them to uh, relate together and the things that they were doing with one another had a positive impact on, on the society as well. I think uh, one of the things that uh, is to be a drawing card for the people of the church is that for those people outside, for them to say, my, those, 
uh, we had somebody here visit some time ago, and they said, it seems like the people there really like each other. Like that was a startling com idea that the people in a church would like each other, enjoy being together with each other, and uh, serving uh, together and being uh, uh, an outreach to the community and being a, having a positive impact on the community. A church should be indeed all that. The early church, the first church, was that. It says this, in closing, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So in addition to the 120 present at Pentecost, then the 3,000 that were added to the faith, so that was now 3,120, the Lord was adding daily to those who were being saved, those who were being called by the Lord. Their number increased daily. Multiplication was happening as the church expanded. It says in chapter 4, verse 4, that uh, many who heard the message believed, and the number of the men, just counting the men there, I'm sorry, ladies, but, uh, you know, back then you're talking about how many were fed at the 5,000 and the 4,000. Uh, counting the men, it was 5,000. So the number went from 3,120. People were being added daily. Now the number gets up to 5,000 men plus. In chapter 5, verse 42, it says, Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news, the gospel, that Jesus is indeed the Christ. Day by day in the temple courts, in the homes, teaching and preaching the gospel. So it says actually in 5, verse 28 of Acts, you who have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. That's what uh, the enemies of Christ in the early church said to them. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And the number eventually gets up to multitudes. You can stop counting when you get to multitudes, you can just say multitudes. I'm looking forward to that day when uh, we don't necessarily, I often say to Bill or to Dave, how many were here today? And uh, usually when I get home and I write down the attendance, uh, I'm, I'm usually pretty accurate on that. But you can stop counting noses when you get to multitudes. And that's what happened in the early church, the first church. So this was the early church. This was the first church, two millennia ago, the church of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ should be doing what they did back then. And if we are doing what they did, I think we can very much expect to see the same results if we're doing what the first church did. We should be doing what they did. And as a result, there will be the joy of seeing people come to faith and be saved. Christians will be enjoying the fellowship. And uh, that's especially needed in the difficult and challenging days in which we live. The church should be expanding and growing, not declining. Denominations after denominations today are losing attendance and membership. Even the Southern Baptists, who were like growing gonzo back in the 20th century, losing members. The Presbyterians, the Methodists, a whole bunch of Methodist churches are leaving the whole denomination. So denomination after denomination, churches after churches are closing. Why? The population is not getting less. There's now 8 billion people living on planet Earth. And like where we're down here, I mean, there's people on top of people. And this part of Milford has got to be uh, 10, 15,000 people. When we did that mailing to the 5,000 homes that were in this area, there was more than 5,000 people in those 5,000 homes. So uh, there's no reason for any church to be declining in its membership unless you're somewhere where everybody moved away. You know, you watch some of these uh, TV shows and there's these ghost towns from out west, you know, where it once was a mining town or something like that, and now it's just empty buildings there. Well, if that's the case, you know, then you know, maybe a church closes. But that's not the case today. Uh, our, our population is increasing, and we got 
millions of people trying to come to this country. You don't see them trying to go to China. You don't see them trying to go to Venezuela or Cuba or North Korea. They want to come here. Why? So we got no, no shortage of people. The world is coming to us. And if we're faithful, if we're faithful of being the church as the early church was, we have the same message, we have the same spirit, we have everything they have. There's no excuse why we cannot be experiencing Acts 29, Acts 30, Acts 31, etc. Beyond the chapters of the book of Acts. Jesus said, you will do greater things. You will do greater things. Certainly not greater in, in quantity, uh, in quality, but in quantity. In quantity. Because why? Uh, there are various ways that we can reach out and do today and more people that exist. So if we are indeed doing what the first church did, we are just experiencing the same blessings that they experienced. People being saved, Christians enjoying fellowship and dealing with together the challenging days and times in which we live. May the Lord enable us to indeed experience what the early first church did. If we're faithful, if we're faithful, we can expect that. Let's close in prayer. <coughs> Lord, we're thankful for the church that you, you instituted and created and the, the church that uh, has been here for 2,000 years and will be here until you return. Help us to be faithful to the message. Help us to be faithful to the fellowship and to all that you would enable us and want us to be for your honor and glory, for your purposes here on earth as your body. And we ask and pray this in your name. Before we gather around the table, our message today is uh, and song is number 114, Built on the Rock. Number one. The early apostles and disciples and Christians, many times when they would gather to eat, they would also um, have communion, remembering the body of Christ and his shed blood. And so today, we remember that as well, and as Jesus 
observed the Passover. He took elements of the Passover and filled them with the new meaning that now Christians have done for 2,000 years. The broken body of Christ is emboldened in the bread. The bread, his body broken for us. We remember that today. As he gave thanks and broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we indeed thank you that you sent your son that was willing to come to come to earth as a little baby, grow up, go to the cross, and there on the cross to bear our sin, to take our place. And because of that, we are able to gather in your name as members of your body. We thank you for the body of Christ making that possible. We remember that in the bread. Amen. My body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out. Lord, in your word, you tell us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That the sacrifice of animals and shedding of blood, which took place for those many years, believers then were experiencing cleansing through faith in the sacrifice of an animal and shed blood. We remember today the one complete sacrifice that Jesus made for us, bearing our sin in his body shedding his blood, blood cleansing us, as well as giving us life and life eternal. We remember that sacrifice today. 
and become a part of Christ. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. After they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And we will do that in a little bit. We have no Mount of Olives, but we do have a sound. Pastor Ken, I wanted to mention another first church. Greg and I were away in New Hampshire last week, and I went to the first congregational church in Swansea, New Hampshire, last Sunday. The first church in Swansea. Yes. They were founded in 1741, and their existing building was built in 1836, so it's even older than this building here. Again, they're an aging con congregation. Um, I think they're average age is probably older than our congregation right now. There was probably about 30, 35 people in the sanctuary, but they have a new pastor who's very young. I'm th thinking probably late 30s, um, who just arrived in December. So they are, they are hopeful that their congregation is going to grow. So keep them in your prayers. Anybody else? Jan Matthew, you want to start today? Sure. Well, just continuing on with my Uber Riders, you know, I had this guy, I picked him up the other night at the boat, the ferry, and took him up to um, to the casino. So um, I got to talk to him for like a good hour. So, you know, he's talking about the world and like all the different things, like, you know, pride and everything. And he goes, you know, in every Bible, in my Bible, this guy's talking about the Bible. And you know what I mean? Here he is going to the casino and just like, I'm like, okay. 
So then he wants to talk about the Bible. So he goes, in every Bible, it says man with woman, no, none of this other stuff. So he's coming out, he goes, what's the right way? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that was my introduction. I said, you know what? Jesus is the only person that ever said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. This man listened to me. And he goes, what Bible should I read from? And I told him, get the new King James Version. He wrote it down. But I'd like to pray for him. I think his name was Juan. You know, the, the, someone else got on the right, so, you know, there's a different name on there. So, But he's really seeking. He's over in the Islip, Long Island. He came over just, you know, on the ferry and then went up to the casino. But I'd like for everybody to keep me in their prayers, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Anyone else this morning? Lori? Please pray for me and my family. Uh, we just went through a disaster. And also I wanted to pray for me and Tom, where we are, what, where we're going to be going away. Okay, Lori, we'll keep you all in prayer. And I hope you have a wonderful trip away, the two of you. I hope it's relaxing. Beverly. Good morning. Um, I'd like prayers for our friend Ellie. She has a gastrointestinal issue and may be going through some procedures to correct it. Probably going to tell me why did you say anything, but yeah. I want you to all keep her in her, our prayers. Okay. We'll keep Ellie in our prayers. We always do anyway. So, Anyone else this morning? Kathy. <laughs> I just want, want to, good morning everyone, I just want to um, ask everyone to keep my dad in prayer. He was diagnosed with um, dementia. Uh, so, you know, I took the Parkinson's diagnosis really well, because I knew with Parkinson's, like eventually comes the onset of dementia. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's in begin the beginning of February, and now he was diagnosed with um, with dementia. So I just have to just ask to keep him in prayer. His name is Bill, right? Bill, yes. Bill. Yes. Bill. Okay. yes. So I'll yes. Keep, continue yeah. to keep he's, Bill. Um, he's confused, and, uh, you know, I knew there was something going on when he told me on Friday that he went to the Baldwin Center to a, a concert, and he almost missed the bus to get back to where he was. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, as long as you had a great time at the Baldwin Center. <laughs> You know, and you got back safe. Yes, good answer. Good but I'm, answer. But I'm, I'm learning with, with not just me, but with other people that are dealing with dementia. Um, if you put yourself into their reality rather than trying to take their reality yeah. and, you know, you know, go, you know, go back and forth with them. It's just, yeah. it's just so much easier. So if you can just put yourself into their reality, yep. it's just things it go much smoothly. I mean, I know he didn't go to the Baldwin Center, but yeah. instead of arguing with him, no, no, you know. So if you just put yourself in their reality, things kind of go a lot easier. It does go a lot more smoothly. Yeah. So, yeah. So. yeah. Kathy, how old is the bill? 90. 90. He'll be 91 in, in, um, Uterus. in October. Good morning. I would like to uh, say thank you to God for all his help, for all the people that he's been putting in my way to help me one way or another, especially for everyone that has been praying for me, and also to uh, keep my daughter and her family protected and safe and uh, hopefully stress-free. My daughter just finished a uh, paper of 30 pages and now she has to uh, have a, an oral exam about it and um, and also for prayers with my mountain I will bore you with everything because God knows what I'm talking about thank you Beatrice glad to have you here today we, we know that you're dealing with a mountain right now and uh, a lot of people praying for you so. anybody else 
Jim. Just want to thank everyone for all their thoughts and prayers during my uh, adventure. We're glad to have you back, Jim. Glad to be here. But we missed the stories. Uh, <laughs> I go to my email now. There's no stories. I can make up a few. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, let uh, Pastor Ken will close us out. Jim, we're keeping you in our prayers. I know you had surgery. And um, talked uh, this week to Jack, who had a uh, knee operation. I see Tom is looking pretty spry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anthony here is bouncing around like a uh, new hip. Uh, Steve Wingfield. The chaplain from NASCAR that was with us had double knee replacement on Thursday. Uh, now, now he married a sweet gal that's a, a private duty nurse, so he's getting help hand and foot. But uh, pray for um, Steve, Steve's recovery from uh, double knee surgery. And our friends, um, the Jobs, whose um, son took his life. The burial is uh, in a military cemetery on Tuesday. So I'd ask you to pray for uh, the Jobs, Bruce, Bruce and Terry, and uh, their, their daughters. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to speak to you, the God, the creator, the sustainer of the whole world, worlds and universes, but yet um, our Heavenly Father, that we're able to uh, unburden ourselves uh, by sharing with you our burdens and concerns and issues, as well as to pray for others uh, as we share in, in their burdens and concerns. And we bring these matters before the throne, not to your attention, because you, you do know all things, but you invite us to pray, you even command us to pray, because in doing so, we are demonstrating our faith, our belief uh, that you indeed can not only hear but make a difference. And we always have that confidence that uh, you, our Heavenly Father, knows what is best, the best outcome in all these matters. And so we rest in that. And now we close by praying the way your Son taught us to pray, by saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy, thy name, name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done. done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. stand together and sing. God, indeed, you are holy, and we thank you because of your spirit in our hearts and lives, we can also indeed know your sanctification, your holiness in our lives. May we 
evidence that this week in the corrupt era that we live in show forth a message of hope and salvation. We give thanks for you enabling us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.